Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. everyone and welcome back. Um, so just a note, uh, thank you very much for enjoying the long day yesterday. Apparently it was the hottest day in the UK since 1976 uh, and you will have noticed that the air conditioning partially failed. I think it was still cooler than outside but yeah thanks to all of you also for, who stayed for the Cotan contest. A really proud uh, um, event because half of you attended and there were messages sent in my team worldwide to kind of uh, give the high scores etc. So you will hear more uh, tonight about who won and how, how, it, how it went. Um, but at this stage I'd very much like to introduce my colleague Natasha millet Frailing. Um, Natasha heads our integrated systems group and she will tell us uh, a little bit more about her research today. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Scarlett. I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here because you are the perfect audience from my perspective. Um, I'm using a particular topic here. It's called real-time ad bidding and user surveillance to talk about the bigger issue um, about advertisements and uh, user surveillance we all sort of know. Uh, I will show you how we use computer science techniques to investigate that issue a bit uh, more. But uh, you will see my, my really agenda is to talk today about this really interconnectedness between the technology, practices, business models, and social implications. So, to, so the, the topic I have picked really is to make you aware that um, while you are studying for your PhD, you have to think about yourself as future leaders. You will be the innovators, you'll be running companies, you'll be asked to participate in policy discussions, and after all, you will have families and kids, and you'll be thinking about what the social impact uh, of technology is for yourself and for them. Uh, in, in this particular talk, uh, I, I will start with uh, uh, examples of how certain things kind of creep into our lives, so how the technology starts in introducing new practices, and then when the new practices kind of take root, guess what happens then? Then the businesses come in and say, okay, this is very interesting. Obviously, this is creating value. The value obviously leads to money, and then money then leads to further innovation. So this, this healthy cycle of innovation, practices and technologies that come in. And I, um, I will now show you uh, an, another connection to this, how the innovation often is driven by data. Um, and you will hear a lot about big data, a lot about machine learning, a lot about uh, all sorts of techniques that would improve our lives in the future. I just wanted to make sure, uh, sure that you're aware that data-driven innovation is everywhere, and uh, you have to be very careful how that innovation is being used. So starting from a practice, um, I lived in the United States for a while, and uh, I remember on Sundays you get newspaper, and then you open the newspaper, and then what happens on the floor spills this whole huge uh, pile of coupons. And, and so this is the practice. You can entertain yourself, cut these coupons, and then go shopping, and then you get some discount, and yeah. So it feels good, at least. Um, and this couponing, in fact, is part of um, a very important um, ecosystem in which retailers promote their products and then drive uh, user habits and they uh, drive the sales. What is interesting with these coupons, uh, the coupons were actually part of what we call convergence. So I, when I have a coupon, I, I, I go and buy something. So the, the ultimate goal is achieved. I actually bought the product. So these coupons uh, at the time were seen and still in use. I use really as a, as a very, very good and effective way to make people buy things, yeah. But let's just understand a little bit what, what is involved. So I'm a consumer, I cut the coupon, I go to a retailer and buy. But then this coupon needs to be uh, cleared. In a way, somehow it has to go back to the manufacturer of the product. So if I bought a soap, I bought it in Tesco, well, it has to go back to the manufacturer. And, and there is a, the intermediate stages where um, this sort of uh, um, you know, coupons that the, the, the proof of, uh, and the proof of a purchase in fact need to be processed and is done in retail um, uh, clearing houses and then manufacturing clearing houses. Just to give you some idea uh, how big that business is, and this is all data because um, I'm showing you practice that was predominant uh, within the past 10 years, however now it's being replaced by new practices. So if you just look at the 2,000 manufacturing firms, you will see that 
they, they produce a, a massive amount of coupons, about 300 billion coupons that are actually printed. Um, and only about, what, 1% um, you know, of that, in fact, gets redeemed. So you, now you look at the effectiveness ratio of uh, creating coupons and then making people buy, buy things. Um, um, the question then was, so can you improve this method? And what is the problem with this method? Why how do you want to improve this method? I mean, if, to, if, if you look at the amount of money that is being exchanged, uh, the amount of money that's being printed in coupon is, is, is a, a really very, um, a very large. As you can see, at the top of the pyramids of manufacturers prepare to give away discounts just to drive, the, uh, just to drive their business and sales. So we are talking lots of money here. Uh, uh, the, the, the figure that you see here, 317 billion, that's, that's the discount. You can imagine what is the actual um, return uh, if you can actually sell everything you, you decide to discount. So this is the practice and this is the ecosystem. And I just want to show you now how this sort of practice have been digitized, if you wish. <laughs> so uh, the same practice, but uh, sort of the same need, if you wish, for retailers to uh, reach uh, uh, and uh, sort of direct people to purchasing. But it's happening in a me different medium. And it is a medium that's called uh, the internet, it's, it's the web. The web became a new sort of uh, real estate. It's a, it's, a, it's a new place where you can post these advertisements and then people may be able to act on them. Um, um, the, the issue here is that when I go say to New York Times, I don't quite expect that I would find coupons there. But yes, in the New York Times and I bought it, yes, I, there were coupons inserted in, in, in the newspapers. So where are they now? Uh, well, there are these little advertisements that you see. Um, and if you look, analyze the page a little bit, then you see that there are actually a number of different parties involved uh, when you're down on the, the, the page of New York Times. Um, and they, they all sort of contribute uh, to the content that's being put there. So there must be some sort of relationship between New York Times and the providers of the ads. And so uh, this, this presentation here will be about understanding that ecosystem. The practice was the one that we know, and it, previously it was done in a different form. It has been now moved into digital, and we'll see now how this has changed. Uh, I will show you now um, a, a little demonstration system that was built for Firefox, uh, and just show you uh, how much of this involvement of uh, other parties in the web page is. But I just want to emphasize here that it's not just in, in the internet browser. Uh, this is happening everywhere. It's happening in uh, mobile and also to dedicated applications. So not just browser as an application, but any other app that you use on your desktop or on the, uh, on the mobile. So if I go to, um, I just do search for the New York Times. And so this is the New York Times official site. So when I'm downloading the New York Times official site, the page is loaded. And at that time, all the advertisements are being now uh, brought in. And what you just saw coming from the top of the screen are all the cookies, or uh, cookies that are now installed on my computer. Each bar corresponds to different domain, so different third party. So all these third parties at the moment are interested in me. I am looking at the New York Times, and they are uh, in co cooperation with New York Times, bringing in the content to me. Some of the content is visible and some is not visible. So if I, if I click, for example, on this uh, bar here, the green one is New York Times. That one shows me 45 cookies from New York Times that are loaded on my computer. Um, all others are third parties. Uh, so for example, here is a double click. A double click put only two cookies. And the only problem is that double cook put the same two cookies on other 160 uh, sites that I have visited. Uh, it's not just double click, there are many others. Uh, one that is quite prominent is a Rubicon project, for example. Um, but any of these, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, let me just show you another one. This is Microsoft one, um, MSN. MSN put 15 cookies, uh, but also MSN has put same cookies on 45 other domains. The thing is that uh, MSN cookies, um, sorry, other domains all sort of have the same MSN.com extension, <laughs> um, which means that in this case, the third parties that are involved are the, 
partners of MSN to bring in the content. If I go back to um, double click, uh, it's slightly different. Uh, so double click put uh, um, the same cookie on a number of different sites, New York Times uh, and say if wired, independent and so on. Now New York Times and independent are very unlikely to be in a cooperative mode. And so, so basically what he was saying, the, the cookies and the domain involved, they reflect different relationship between the first party and the third party. Now I will show you, we implement, we basically deployed this prototype and gave it to about 13, 14 people because we were interested to understand uh, how this network of people of uh, third parties interact and see what is the exposure of individuals just like ourselves um, to these third parties as we browse the web. So um, I have here a, a graph that is created using um, a, a toolkit that Microsoft Research actually um, created and then um, released. It's called Node Excel. Um, you can download Node Excel if you want to play with your own cookies. Uh, it's very simple. You, you basically, um, you can sniff the HTTP traffic. You can look at the uh, communication between um, w um, when you land on the site, you just look at what, which sites were referred to. And then look at these pairs, and then you can put the pairs into Node Excel, and, and then you will get a graph. The graph shows you the, uh, which site refers to which other site when you're loading the page. So in this graph, the green dots are the websites that the person visited over a period of seven days. In fact, I filter out most of the sites. Uh, you can dis uh, in Node Excel, you can determine which ones are more important nodes by looking at in-links and out-links. Okay. So um, if I, for example, click on one of these sites here, like eHow, uh, when you do your searches, you often end up on eHow. Sorry, let me just, oh, let me just say. My mouse is not working properly. So say, if I go to Forbes, for example, um, as soon as I land on Forbes, uh, you get all these third parties involved. And um, the links from, from the green dot is referring to, this, uh, to these other third parties. Now, among these third parties, I've put two different colors. There are uh, red ones and purple ones. They have slightly different in-links and out-links profiles. So if I click on double-click, double-click has a lot of in-links coming from the websites who are subscribed to uh, double-click, but also has out-links to other red and purple sites. So that means that the, that node in particular serves as a broker between the websites and we, you know, users, we are trotting around the web. We are landing on these websites, the green ones, and then the information then flows to double click and then and flows to others. Um, the other type of node, the purple one, is slightly different. These are all in links coming from green sites. Um, the purple one, this in particular one is called uh, Google Analytics because it provides analytics per site. So every site, so these sites actually subscribe to analytics because they want to uh, understand what's happening on their websites. So, so information then goes only one way. Now in this, this case, the problem is that both the double click and Google Analytics, they belong to the same entity and they're all this, uh, this, the same company, Google. So in a way, what you have at the moment is um, tracking across and tracking within websites. Uh, this is not, uh, the, uh, this basically is just uh, for one person and it doesn't completely give us uh, the, the full uh, idea, the complete idea how strong this network is. So we have done a couple of other studies that I'll show you. But uh, I want you to uh, keep this picture in mind. This is you and me and everybody else who is uh, using the web. Uh, and there are ways you can kind of reduce these links and kind of uh, clean them up for, for a while. But then I'll show you to a couple of studies, uh, how quickly you get back into the network. Yeah. So back to the um, uh, presentation, just want to show you how the ecosystem looks like. So this is, this is what's happening at the moment. Uh, when you are looking at the web page, that's essentially a place now that people are bidding for. They want to bid for spaces there to put the advertisements. And so they, you have this um, uh, typical demand and supply um, I'm a supplier, I have a web website, and I'm prepared to give people uh, space to put, put the advertisements on. And then, then there is, of course, there is demand. Suppose you are IBM, or you are, um, I don't know, Toyota or somebody, and you have this new product, 
and you want to advertise. Of course, you can advertise on your own site, but why would you if you can also advertise <laughs> everywhere else on the web? So that's why there are these brokers. Brokers essentially say, well, we will decentralize this. You don't have to have uh, uh, advertisers only on your site. We will coordinate that, and then you can advertise everywhere. But then to be eff effective in this, then they start promoting um, real-time uh, tracking of individuals because they want to make sure that advertisement is relevant. And of course, the people who are putting advertisements, they want to understand the context. Uh, some, in some contexts, may be completely inappropriate so for, uh, for your ad. So, so there's a sort of, there's good reason why these brokers, in fact, want to do a good job. The thing is that we are the casualty. <laughs> so we, we basically get tracked every second. And I'll show you now, uh, this is, a, this is a, um, a graph I got from my colleagues at UCL. Um, uh, 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 they basically, um, Shua Yuan and his advisor, Yung, Yung Wang, they, they wanted to understand how quickly this uh, sort of cycle happens. And everything has to ha happen within 100 milliseconds. So while you are loading the page, information about you is being sent, the bidding happens, and the page is loaded with all the ads. And I say this is absolutely fantastic. I mean, this is the, the technological marvel of the 21st century. If you can do this, um, you can go beyond the moon, <laughs> I can tell you. It's, it's really, if you think how many millions of people um, are using the, the infrastructure and how many people are bidding, um, it's just fantastic that it can be achieved. Yeah. And, and there are clever machine learning models in there. So, so it's not just trivial, it is really quite sophisticated, it's a sophisticated system. So let me now show you a couple of studies that we have done to understand a little bit more uh, the ecosystem and the, uh, what, it, what it means for us when we use certain services online. So we all use search. So we did a, a little bit of an analyzing um, exposure to cookies through search. Again, the objective is just to understand the, the, the ecosystem. So here are two pages. Uh, one is Bing, one Google. You, you have a search query, and you get to your ten, top 10 results. So suppose you're just going down and checking the results. So we, this is exactly what we've done. We, we tracked, if you're going down these results, who is now watching, who is now being in, involved in your experience, although you don't know it. Yeah? So um, we, we've done a, a, an experiment with uh, uh, hundreds of queries, and those are borrowed from another uh, computer science competition organized by KDD. Some times ago, um, we were all very concerned about how to um, guess people's intent, or how do you classify queries. So are there travel queries, or are there uh, you know, uh, information uh, gathering queries, or what are they? So um, we had um, researchers actually label these queries, and then we use categorization of these queries to categorize more queries. But for this purpose, we re re reuse these queries just to understand whether if you're searching when you're shopping or you're looking for a news, whether you have the same exposure to cookies. Okay, so that was one of the ideas in the, in the design. So um, we ran the experimentation with 66, 660 queries, and they're sort of divided in these categories. And um, decided to fire these queries again uh, two search engines, Bing and Google, and uh, we've done it in four different markets, all English-speaking markets, uh, just to see whether any of these factors make a difference. And um, in the analysis, just like you saw with uh, Node Excel, this is also another graph of Node Excel, uh, the, we, we plotted what we call the connected component, the largest connected component in the network, just to see how these websites and the trackers are connected. And this is, this is what we get. It's really, it's a jumble. It's an extremely tightly connected um, network. Um, if it is it out a little bit, you know, perforce it with some kind of clustering algorithms, um, this is what you get. So yes, the, the, there are some, some sort of subclusters in, in this connected component, but uh, there are lots of cross-linking, as you can see. In the gray, these are the links from one quadrant to another, just showing that while there is a stronger affinity of some websites to subscribe to some of the third parties, uh, there is still very, very strong um, interlinking among all of them. So here, the, the, I should explain that the red ones are the trackers, the black ones are the, uh, the websites, and in the purple are also 
uh, 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 third parties involved in the process. Um, we are, there is not much difference. This, is, this particular one is for Google in India market. This is the Google in US market. So you don't get much difference. In fact, um, if you look at the uh, structure of the websites, of, of the uh, connected components across all these markets, here is what you get. The most important figures are on the bottom. Uh, we are wondering how many nodes and how many links are in fact in this connected component. And, and you can see when it comes to nodes, very high up, you know, 92, 93 um, percent. So some of the, uh, there are some of the outliers that are not in the connected component. But if you look at the, the edges, most of the edges are there. So that means whoever is outside the connected component doesn't really count. They're not, not very well connected with others. Yeah. Yeah, so, so this is how it is. Um, you imagine now the internet, this is the web, this is what we experience when we, when we um, look around things. And on top of it, there's this network. And you saw the connected component of that. On top of it is a network bidding on us. So it, it, essentially, we are being looked at, we have, our information is in real time tracked, and then based on that, the act and then serves as the content. Uh, if you want to, um, I mean, the main argument is that this is all for your benefit or my benefit because we get better advertisements. Okay, so, so now if we did mindset, if you want to, to make sure that you have very good advertisements, um, the question is how can you make sure that all these trackers are on your back quickly because they will, they, they will give you better advertisements. And, and here are some graphs. Um, essentially, we looked at how many clicks uh, do we need to make in order to be tracked by the, tra the third parties with certain uh, probability. So here on the bottom are the number of clicks, and here is the probability that, for example, you'll be tracked by Google Analytics or DoubleClick, or this is, this is basically the graph that tells you if you want to be tracked by all 10, top 10 advertisers, uh, sorry, uh, third party advertisers, um, what the curve would look like. And it, basically, it is about, if, if you do 20 clicks within the context, you, you'll, be have, uh, you'll be tracked with 90% probability by all 10. And with 31, 30 clicks, you are in. Yeah. So, so in a way, um, there's not much. It doesn't take much uh, to be part of that network. OK. Um, a slightly different topic um, related to the same sort of uh, phenomenon. It is about understanding what are the other implications. Uh, so, so we now understand there is a network of information, and on top of it, there is a network of advertisements and trackers. Um, but then how do we act knowing, or knowing that this is happening? Um, I mean, it's a common practice. It's a very common practice for us to share URLs. You send me an email, it's very likely that there'll be one URL in my email. Uh, and then what happens if that, that happens on, in a medium like Twitter? So I'm happy I have you know, 10,000 followers. Now I'm sharing a URL. Yeah, so now 10,000 followers are going to get that URL. And 10,000 followers will get the, all these trackers on their backs in a second. Yeah, so, so in, in a way, because of, of, of this uh, structure that we have seen, net, uh, networks of information and then on top is a network of trackers, whatever you do, you will be exposing yourself or other people. It doesn't matter which service you use. And if you're interested, just a little study here. We looked at the tweets um, related to topics and um, you know, um, following individuals. And just to understand a little bit how this social medium uh, exposed people to tracking. Um, we looked at um, only the uh, those uh, tweeters that, uh, tweets that have URLs in it, so that we, we could uh, look at observe the uh, who are the trackers. And, and here is um, what we normally find: which are the domains uh, that are normally tweeted a lot. In, in our sample, um, these are YouTube primarily. What was interesting one? The interesting one was the Tumblr, uh, because the Tumblr is almost like a um, collection of pages where each individual can have a little website, uh, the sites. And what happens is people would put content on, the, on those sites. So therefore, Tumblr looks really bad because it has about 246 trackers just, just by, based on the tweets that we looked at. Um, these are the number of trackers that we found per URLs that are being tweeted a lot about. 
Um, I'm showing you now for a particular um, a hashtag for the politics, uh, how the social graph looks like. So in this case, nodes are slightly different. Nodes are individuals. So each node is an individual. And the, the, the size of the, um, the node depends on how many followers the person has. But the color depends on how active people are, so how often they retweet. So the red ones are really active people. And then if I tease this out a little bit, this, is, this, this component here, uh, this is how it looks if you do uh, clustering. So you can see that some people retweet more among each other. And these are the, the people just, um, the links among these people are only if they, they tweet, retweeted or tweeted something that has a URL in it. So you can now see that these people keep contaminating each other. So this circle here are likely to retweet among themselves. And they're right likely to sh probably share uh, you know, the same um, trackers. Uh, here some, will be some more statistics. Nothing new here. It's just showing that the same, same companies are involved in, in tracking. And the, 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 the likelihood that you will be exposed is very, very high. OK. Um, I'd like to sh skip now to uh, one other aspect. We, we did try to understand who are these trackers and how are they, what are their functions. Because at the beginning, I showed you the third parties can be um, uh, essentially content providers that come in together to, to assemble a page for myself. So I, I would like to kind of tease out among these three third parties who I'm dealing with, what are their functions, and how can I recognize them. Yeah. So this is a different graph in which we just look at the trackers and their relationships. Among them, uh, the graph is obtained by looking in, at 20 sites. You see the black dots here are, are websites. Um, those 20 sites f uh, were found very frequent in the, in the uh, search pages. So th you may see eHow is almost present ev everywhere, wherever you go type in something, they will tell you how to fix your car or how to fix the light bulb. So eHow is the, the site that often appears in search results. And the primary function is to bring in the trackers into your world. They have lots of advertisements and they have lots of people looking at you at that time. So among the trackers, again, are, are the ones, the, the red ones here, are the ones that we have seen. Those are the, the brokers. Okay, so the, the, the brokers are the ones that, uh, that connect the ecosystem. The green ones here are the websites, the, the, the sites that actually deliver the content, so add servers. Okay? But the blue ones are, from my perspective, most problematic ones. So the blue ones are the domains that we do experience, we actually go to because we know the domain. The red ones, I, don't, I never heard of DoubleClick before I started looking at this, because I never go to a website of DoubleClick. Okay? So, it's out of my experience and out of my desire to connect with. But others are there. The blue ones are there. So if you go to Facebook or you go to, to LinkedIn or you go to Twitter, these companies, in fact, provide a service. Yet the little signs, the tweet sign or the F sign, the links in sign, those are the trackers. And you see them now everywhere. So in a way, uh, there are, there, there are these new uh, so the visible networks are coming in, but we don't. We were not told that, in fact, those little little uh, icons that appear on almost every page now, in fact, are the means for uh, tracking our activities. And you can also argue, well, why, this is all anonymous, so why would I care? In most instances, they may just tag me. The cookie basically is like a badge. They they tag me and they follow me. They may not know who I am. They may create an identity, uh, you know, ID of me in their system and, and, and then use it somehow. But if you have companies who do know where, who we are, uh, it's very easy then for everything that you do on the web becomes uh, um, attached to you. So it's not anonymous anymore. So it just happened to be logged onto uh, Twitter or logged onto Facebook when you're doing search. You should know that your whole search history now is in their hands. But uh, he said that at some, uh, some point they were advised not to use Google as a search engine because Google would track what uh, searches took place in, in that department so they could, could kind of foresee what mm -hmm. political decisions, for example, what our topics are, what yeah. <laughs> so it's getting yeah. quite dangerous. 
Yeah, please. Uh, I have a question. Well, actually, my please, question, yeah. In this, case, in this case, you can get to choose whether Google or Microsoft sees the decisions if you're using Google or Bing. But my, my, my question is... Yeah, uh, sure. It's not, not against uh, <laughs> Google. And, I mean, not to say that, that uh, yeah, Microsoft is, is better or any of the yeah. others, but... Um, sure. uh, my, my question is, I, I don't get the part about if, if you're... If you're using, uh, how, how can a third party see all of your Google search history? It's, it's, it's uh, so uh, uh, what I basically said, when you are, uh, when you have the the cookie on your uh, co computer, and the, in, in this case, say for example, is the um, uh, the, the the Facebook, uh, or if you, if you just go to a page and and you might be a Facebook user, but at that point you're not logged in, uh, so they would not know. They would just know that. Uh, from with how, the, whichever way they identify your machine, that you have been there, just like any other an anonymous cookie. However, if you start now, if you're logged in, that they would know that it was you. Okay. It was you. With, uh, with, with, with the, the example you just said, the Google one, it, how can you go to a third-party website and they see all your search history even if you're logged in? Uh, so uh, uh, what I mean by search history is, is your browsing history. Sorry. So the browsing history uh, is attached to the, the little cookie that is on the page. So uh, any page that actually has that cookie on it, uh, it becomes it's, it's part of your browsing history. But in so. this case, the, the tracker, Google, is the one that will see all your browsing history, not, not the third party. Uh, so what the, um, Scarlett was talking about is slightly different. Uh, Google also has other means. It has a, a toolbar, yep. which actually transmits everything. Um, and um, has double click involved in the advertising with everybody almost. So, 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 so essentially, that company can stitch up um, things across and within, plus uh, all your uh, improvement with search through to, 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 to bar. That particular company has a, a fantastic reach. Okay, but uh, you have similar thing combination of these different things for other companies like Yahoo and others. I didn't phrase my question correctly. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I understand the part that Google can stitch up everything and, and track all your browsing and yeah. search and everything and, and, and all the history. But I'm, I'm talking about a third party. How 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 can a th you, you, what I understood is sometimes when you log into a third party that has a Google component, this third party ABC.com anything web website can have access to your search or browsing history. Is, is, is that no, that wasn't, that's not the statement, no. Uh, so, oh, okay. so, yeah, yeah. Maybe I can show you, uh, I'll show now the mechanism of how this works. So, so we can then, in your mind, you can see what sort of traffic happens, yeah. yeah. Um, so let me just show you, I mean, in the next stage, really, I just want to discuss with you uh, where all this started and why it started and why we end up this way, because you will be involved in designing new technologies. And whenever the new technologies comes in, you have to think about the usage of it. And what happens is you have organizations, standard organizations that are looking at this. And I just want to show you, um, in, in particular, about 20 years ago, I saw the first document from 1996, and I'll, I'll show you in the middle of the one from uh, 2000, where people were really thinking hard about how the communication with the web will happen, what are the protocols, and how, um, how we can enable the use of the web, but at the same time be aware of the user issues. So in particular, with the hypertext transfer protocol, there was an issue that you could not uh, sustain the state. You would not know um, uh, user's actions, in, uh, uh, con uh, con uh, uh, sequential user actions, because the server that you're communicating with had no means of knowing what you were doing on your client side. So in order to enable what we call sessions, so that we can now uh, do uh, things like in e-commerce, having a shopping basket or something like this, uh, we had to have a, a mechanism that would communicate between the client and the server what the user is doing. And that was, that was the, the, the reason why the cookies were put in place. Yeah, so the cookies essentially is communication, uh, uh, small text files that are being, or uh, text messages that are being transferred between uh, on a user agent on the, on the user side. So user agent has a representation like through a browser. And then on the side, other side you have a web server. 
and the communication between them, in, in fact, is the one uh, through passing messages. Okay. Um, so let me just show you an example. Suppose you log in onto a site. Um, so um, user identifies. So you can type in your password and log in, and then the server basically puts the message, puts uh, uh, transfers the message. Uh, cookie puts on the, on on my machine. No, I'm John Smith. So John Smith received a little cookie saying, "Oh, here's your John Smith registered." So now I, John Smith, I'm now browsing the site, and I do, did some action. Okay, and so now the server knows what action it is. So I'm looking for a rocket launcher one. So I, I selected the rocket launcher one on this e-commerce web e website. Okay, and then the server puts a cookie on my uh, computer uh, uh, um, message that is actually. Uh, records that information. And I said, my next step is I, I continue using the site, say I'm, I want a shipment of the, um, the launcher to my home, and uh, then the server puts back information about, okay, I use FedEx. So, so what happens is now in my um, cache, um, web cache, uh, I do have all these cookies sorted, uh, st uh, stored, which shows what I have been doing um, with the website. Um, the, the issue then is, if you provide these sort of mechanisms, um, what control should you be giving to people, to users, and how should this um, potential risk to privacy be mediated? So this is a document, if you're interested, you can go online, you can find it from 2000. There was an earlier one from 1996, and, and this is being revised. You can find a more later uh, one from uh, 2011, okay? Um, I just wanted to, uh, to see that people really, uh, and you have to put yourself in their shoes because you, you will be the one doing similar things in the future. It may not be about uh, HTTP protocol, but it may be something about, uh, I don't know, uh, agents that now are, are appearing in Siri and Microsoft Cortana, okay? So there is plenty to think about. How, what, are the, what should be the standards to enable um, the communication between these services? In this particular case, People were aware that, uh, that there is a possibility for intrusion to people's privacy and what sort of things should be allowed. But in this particular case, what they left underdefined is what should be the interface through which they should be exposed. So that they really argue hard uh, for certain things. For example, they wanted to en enable the ag agents of the browser to um, disable cookies or to determine uh, that whether the session is in progress or not in progress anymore. Because you can have cookies that are per session and so on. But most of the cookies are set to expire in 2025. So, so either way, yes, uh, there are provisions there so that you can uh, limit the, the, the duration, but if nobody is checking, then guess what? So, so this is basically what's happening. There have been a number of provisions to think about, but the interface has not been specified. And lots of this has gone un under no, uh, completely unnoticed by end users, so that uh, people did not react and couldn't even voice their uh, opinion. And I'll just show you now the interfaces that are available. So this is typical when you find in a browser, um, at least when I was checking last. So I'm picking the two, say Internet Explorer, Firefox, but Chrome is the same. So uh, the interfaces are really obscure for end users. They may not have much meaning. and I'm, I, I, that's kind of one credit to Firefox. Just look at the, the IE. Say IE has this uh, scale, and you have a scale for the privacy. Now you can ask yourself, what does that mean to you? Can you, what is the privacy, and how do you scale it, or scale it up or scale it down? And um, the issue also is a little bit of confusing interfaces because sometimes uh, you think, okay, I am going to bump up my, my, my privacy uh, scale all the way to the top. And it, this is what happened to me. I, I, I did that, and then I, I click on the advanced features just to find out what, what, what else I can do. And then I realized that whatever I have done um, by default didn't, didn't, didn't check any of the options that I thought would be checked in. So, so for me, it was really confusing. I didn't know what I've done. I didn't know who is controlling what. So of course, this interface may have been done for people setting up machines administrators, so the end users don't have to touch anything. Um, but um, at the moment, definitely under-specifying the, the, the interface, the way people should be informed is, is not 
uh, is not the way to go because the implications of your decisions at the lower level are moving up the, uh, the stack. And so your, your experience um, with the, of the decision, the technologies may, may not be a, a, a completely, um, it's, it's total unawareness of basically what has happened. Uh, I should also say, what I showed you today is the connection between a particular need that exists in, a, um, in the real world. So retailers, uh, retailers are always going to find some way to reach the customers. So that's definitely there. The, the, there are other reasons why people may want to look at the people's uh, histories. And the cookies are really tip of the iceberg. It's really nothing I can just tell you. It, it is one of the most explicit and you can, um, you can, you can identify it. Uh, there are other ways that somebody can track me uh, just by looking at the configuration of uh, what is in my cache. So instead of having a particular cookie to identify me, um, whatever I do with the fingerprinting of my computer or my cache or whatever is a very, very strong way of it identifying me. Um, but one important thing here is that, uh, one important thing here is that uh, with cookie tracking, if you're studying, say, security and privacy, you almost have something that's called a, a coordinated privacy attack. Uh, so in order for this to function, you've got websites and you have third parties and you have fantastic infrastructure to do the bidding and deliver your content and so on. What is more disturbing um, are possibilities for independent privacy attacks um, where anybody can spy on anybody else. And recently we have done some work and I've seen some posters. So some of you are looking at um, cache timing attacks, for example, in the browser, where there was a particular specifications of how you can interact with the cache browser. Um, um, just like a cookie was managed, similarly, the access to the cache was managed. But again, uh, what happens in practice, you cannot control. It is the nature of the beast. Whatever technology you develop, and you will see that when you develop your own prototypes, you develop them for a particular purpose, and you give them to people, and you watch what they do. And then you get humbled immediately because the creative power of individuals is fantastic. You know, we humans are just fantastic. We're going to repurpose anything for anything else. So, so you can never anticipate which way things are going to go. And in many instances, you will be delighted because it's the discovery of some new opportunity. And in other instances, you will be agonizing. How could I have done that? Okay. So unfortunately, you know, in, in, in kind of this presentation, I just want to show you um, a lot of us here work on lower levels. We love, work on the architectures, we work on protocols, we work on algorithms. We do all sorts of fantastic stuff to innovate. But if you don't go all the way up or team up with other people who are looking at the um, higher levels, so up the stack, and in this case it's the user interface, and it's the user experience, the user interaction, then it is really, really hard uh, to anticipate the impact of your technology. <laughs> technology itself may not, is benign. It is the use of it. So if I, I can leave any message for you, it is really to team up among yourselves. So if you're working on, say, networking, make sure you talk to somebody in a HCI. Make sure also to talk to somebody in the middleware. Because uh, only us to, all together will be able to conceive what's, what's, uh, what's uh, happening. And there's nobody else who can address the issues in this particular case of cookies, nobody else but us computer scientists, because others don't know. And I bet you among you, there will, be, uh, there will be people who have not known about this. And so even we who are in the profession do not know. And so there's no, no, nobody to speak up uh, for, in this case, for the, for the users and for the citizens. Because at the moment, uh, it is the, we are heading towards the technocratic society where people who have fingers on their keyboards will be determining what sort of new practices and technology has come in. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, Natasha. It was a great talk. I'm sure it's got us all up. Um, there are other questions? Yeah, we do. Uh, by the way, we don't have a micro at the moment. I think it's, uh, it's a problem with it, so speak up a little bit. Um, to what extent do you think that the, in, the, feed, the, shape, the direction the internet is now going is shaped by, by like, uh, these ad tracking companies? Because they seem to be like the, a lot of the activity, or like a lot of recent advances, or I say advances, but like a lot of the recent development has 
basically been towards uh, sucking up more of your data and uh, serving it to, to like these big companies that we, we've never heard about, for instance. And do you, do you see that's the, the way the internet is now going? Like, we're just going to give up more and more of like, our privacy and our personal data in exchange for like, shinier objects, essentially. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm actually very optimistic. I, I think uh, the same principle that got us to this position will get us out of that position. Because in the end, it is all about demand. Uh, people have, were not aware of this. People don't know about this. People could not voice. And because they could not voice the satisfaction, there was absolutely nobody else who would come into the market and serve that other demand. Yeah, so if people say, no, we are aware, I want a, I want a different solution, then there will be somebody to step in and bring it in. And, but at the moment, because it wasn't, it's not even voiced, you don't have the fundamental part for the next move in the market. Uh, the fundamental part is the demand. And uh, the privacy has to be seen as a value. Once it's seen as a value, then somebody will pay for it. At the moment, we are being told that we don't value privacy. Uh, that's the main argument. Uh, and, and the sad part is they will actually call on you and say, you don't care about privacy. And I have some teenagers at home, and I can tell you they do care about privacy. It's just slightly different. So if my daughter is on Facebook, she doesn't care whether Facebook knows that she's done something, but she does care whether her mom knows. Okay, so she doesn't want mom on Facebook. So in, in a way, so what I'm saying is the, the privacy control and demand for it is there. Okay, it, it, nobody can tell me it doesn't exist. The, the issue then is that it has not been understood fully where we are now. So the first stage is to inform people. Then they will start their, uh, voicing their opinion. Some of, some of these uh, voices are going to go towards um, um, policy. Yeah, we've already seen this. And some are going to go towards business. And I, I, I feel, so I'm, I'm completely optimistic. Things change very quickly. Once there is demand, things move in, yeah. yeah. So I'm kind of afraid to ask this uh, because I might be then kind of, uh, yeah, okay. So things might not go back to normal anymore. But if you're using Adblock or you're going through Tor, how do these graphs look like? Uh, so like, are you still being ended up, you know, uh, tracked? So even if you're using Adblock, essentially, it takes one tainted third party to expose you to everybody else, right? So are you really safe if you're opting out of cookies and, you know, filtering ads, or in the end, there's no way to opt out? Even if you're using Tor, you know, maybe you get fingerprinted at some point, and then, so what's your, you know? Uh, so at the moment, you're right, basically, you are walking down the streets, and you're trying to protect, uh, trying to shield yourself. You know, you're trying to hide from some people down the streets. But when you're down, walking down the streets, you're walking down the streets. Okay. So as long as that's clear, uh, and I keep telling my kids, look, you're walking down the streets of the internet, and you're half naked. Watch it. <laughs> so you have to be, you have to be, because there's no protection at the moment. So some people who are clever, they can cover themselves. They put in invisibility cloak for a while. But you are still on the streets, and there will be another one, another way. Or lurking at you. The question only is whether there are some other ways to provide the value to you. So whatever you're doing on the streets, they may be done at home. Yeah, maybe there is a different, different paradigm in which you can uh, have your uh, needs satisfied. Um, so yes, what, at, at this moment, because we're all walking down the streets and we don't have any private corners, well, we are learning all these tricks and there'll be, there'll be different ways people are helping us do the private browsing or ad blockers and so on. That's fine. They will have certain effectiveness. But if we voice our opinion that we want something else, then people are going to start building the private homes. They're going to start building the private corners where you can go, and um, you will not have to worry about this. But without us asking, it's not going to happen. So what you're saying is still a false sense of security. Though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, in private browsing, for example, has been um, designed for particular purposes, primarily to clear your machine. So nobody know, if somebody comes to your machine and wants to see what you've done, they won't know. But the service will have still now. Okay. Uh, another thing is, if you are in a private browsing session, uh, you can still be tracked because it is session based, and then session is gone. It, yeah. So, so in a way, whatever has been done has been done to to cover certain scenarios and certain demands. Yeah. yeah. I have a question regarding the network graphs. Um, did you have a specific reason to take in-degree and out-degree centrality as your measure and not, for example, between a centrality if you talk about brokers or alpha factor when it comes to that, say, catch the big fish? Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, the, the nodes were using the between a centrality. I didn't mention this. Thank you for asking. So, yeah, so um, 
uh, the essential thing is how do you create the links? And, and the links were a referral. So who refers to whom? Um, if you do want to study this, you can probably study other aspects of the uh, network. Um, we, we have done some studies of understanding the efficiency of this network. It is a small world network. Basically, it's very shallow, so the information propagates very quickly. So there are the properties of the graph that you can look at. It's not a very complicated graph. You, you could see it because you have very dominant um, um, nodes. We have seen that if you remove some of the dominant nodes, like DoubleClick or uh, Rubicon project, or, then that it becomes less effective. So yes, it's true that uh, these small world networks uh, that they had among the trackers uh, could be sort of disrupted a little bit if you stop some of these uh, major nodes. Uh, can you tell a bit more about the bidding, what kind of information is shared uh, during the bidding? So I, I don't have that precise information. Actually, my colleagues at UCL, they have done uh, much more work on this. Um, I'm actually, my, my guess is that it's not, again, just pure economics. It's not, if I'm a broker, it's not in my interest to share too much. Uh, after all, this is my unique position. I, so I, so it may be that your information does not go very far. And uh, the essence of this is not to know where you live. It's not to know uh, necessarily um, your name or anything. It's, 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 it's about knowing that you have just looked at the PC world and then you went to EasyJet and then after that you're going to go to Amazon. Because that's what they want. They want to know your, tra your path so that they can bring in the ads from the previous sites, guessing your intent. And the price of a display will very much depend on the f uh, how, how often you visited that EasyJet site uh, or how, where, are you, how, where are you in the stage when you're going to Amazon. So is it the first visit, third visit, or fifth visit? And so based, on, so based on this logic, they're trying to model um, what's likelihood that you're going to buy now. Because ultimately, that's the convergence. The convergence that happened with coupons needs to be sort of mimic, mimicked in this world. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. So you're saying that if there's demand high enough, then other ideas will come up to, to make business in that way. So one option would probably be that you have to spend some money to keep yourself private that you could say, okay, I'm opting out of all this cookie thing for $5 a day, and then, then I, I'm not being tracked, uh, for example. Yeah. I mean, there are lots of different models, yeah. Yeah, but what's the kind of the price label that you would put to that? So, uh, so there are people who are trying to identify what would be the cost of privacy. So actually, we had a very good colleague, Zoran Prybush, who was here uh, on our team. And now he is well, with Google, I think. <laughs> So, so he was in fact measuring um, what sort of things you would, uh, what discount would you take to uh, buying chocolates, um, offering in return telephone number, or <laughs> so you can you can go at that level. You can start sort of um, um, hypothesizing and uh, measuring, and then based on that you can design your particular service. Yeah, yeah. So definitely. But if you ask yourself, you're already paying for the internet access. So you, in a way, if you want to understand where in the value chain you will intervene and get more money from people, well, you may do it at the very beginning when you're, doing, um, you're deciding who your internet provider is going to be. So you may be there. They'll connect, collect the money, and then after that, you clean. You, you said, I don't want any. I just want to work with those providers who are going to block everything. Or you can do it at the application level. So there is the whole chain, value chain there. You're welcome.